My name is Allison Arnold. I'm the Agriculture Extension Agent with the Cooperative Extension here in Buncombe County, and I'll be your host today. We'll make time throughout the program for questions, and we invite you to put your questions in the chat box. I want to welcome you to Saturday's seminar, Growing Vegetables and Herbs in Containers. Our speaker today is Kay Green. Kay Green is one of our Buncombe County Extension Master Gardener volunteers, and she's been gardening for over 30 years. She's used a number of different approaches, and for the last six years, her garden has consisted of two small eight by eight foot patches of sloping ground, two small raised, and lots of containers filled with veggies, herbs, and flowers on her small deck. Kay has learned to optimize her small spaces to accommodate shade, partial shade, and full sun plants. By using containers, she is able to expand her growing area considerably, and she gets to enjoy planting and eating fresh veggies. Kay will help us see how to select the right containers and talk to us about soil mixes, fertilizers, and plants for success in small spaces. Take it away, Kay. Thank you folks for tuning in today, and I'm very eager to share with you what I've learned. Let me tell you, I've made more than my share of mistakes along the way, and I'm hoping that the information I share with you today will help you avoid some of the mistakes I have made. So what we're going to cover in today's program are the benefits of container gardening, right place, right plants, right container potting mixes, planting, care and maintenance, and then I'm going to conclude by recommending some specific vegetables and herbs for you. If you take away nothing from today's program than this, you'll still have learned a lot. Master gardeners have a saying, right plant, right place. And what that means is you want to make sure that the plant you are buying is put in the right place. You want to make sure that it gets the right amount of sunshine, the right type of soil, and it is watered correctly. Now with container gardening, we add right container because the type of container you purchase is going to affect how your plants grow. So let's dig into this further. Benefits of container gardening. Well, the biggest one is that the containers are movable. You can move them as the sun moves across your porch. You can move them from a bottom step to the lower step. They are good for small spaces. They add beauty, color, and texture to your environment. And they can overcome poor growing conditions such as poor soil, limited sunlight, and limited space. In addition, they, it's good for people with disabilities and mobility problems. Plants growing in containers have the same basic needs as all plants. They need a good growing medium. They need water, light, temperature, air movement, relative humidity, and fertilization. Selecting the right place, what you need to do is observe the amount of sunlight in the desired areas and watch where it travels during the day. One way to do this is by a chart system called sun mapping. And this is an easy way to help you diagnose whether you have enough sun to grow vegetables and herbs. Most vegetables and her herbs need a minimum of six hours of full sunlight a day. So this is how you go about doing it. On a piece of paper on the left-hand side, you're going to label your areas where you want to put your pots. And then across the top, you're going to put in by hour, the hours of sunlight that you get. So in this instance, we've got sunlight starting at 8 and going till 9 o'clock. So let's take a look at this first portion here. In this back corner garden, we count the sun and we see we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 hours of sunlight. So yes, this would be a great place to put your vegetable pots. Now in the front garden, let's see what happens. We've got one and two hours of sunlight in the morning. 
we've got some dappled sunlight up until 2 p.m. And then we have one, two more hours of sunlight. And then we have partial sunlight and then shade the rest of the day. So that gives us four hours of sunlight and five, six hours of partial light. So this is going to be an iffy place to grow vegetables. You can try it, but you might be disappointed with the results. The vegetables might not prosper as much as you had hoped. Now let's look at this third one. This one, we have shade and then some partial sun. And in this instance, when we're saying partial sun, that means if you have a four by five spot, half of it might be in sun and half of it might be in shade. So we've got some partial sun and then we've got one, two, three, four, five hours of sunlight followed by partial sunlight. So this is another iffy spot. It might work, but you still might need a sunnier place. So that's how you can determine quickly whether you have enough sun to grow vegetables and herbs. Sun requirements. When you go to buy plants, they are marked with the amount of sun they need. Full sun usually is labeled six to eight hours. That's a minimum, not a maximum. So that's the minimum amount of sunlight that they need. Partial sun or partial shade is three to six hours of direct sun per day. Partial sun usually implies that the plant needs more sun and is more heat tolerant and can tolerate some afternoon sun. Partial shade implies that the plant should be protected from afternoon sun and these plants prefer morning sun. Dappled shade is similar to partial shade. The sun is making its way through the branches of the tree. And shade means less than three hours of direct sun per day. How do you go about selecting the right plant? You always want to buy a high quality plant. Start off good, you'll probably end up good. Make sure that the entire plant looks healthy. You want to pick up the pot and view it from all sides. The plant should be lush and full with no empty spots, no dead material or weeds. The leaves should be true to their type and not limp. The underneath of the leaves should not show any signs of insects or diseases. And you want to make sure that the stock is sturdy. You can check the roots by sliding the plant out of its pot. For the most part, healthy plants should have white or tan roots that are growing toward the bottom of the container. You want to avoid any plants that have roots that are circling horizontally. The plant is being root bound and it means that it needs a bigger pot or needs to go into the garden. That's panning plants. You want to make sure that when you're taking your plants home that they haven't been be exposed to extreme wind, sun, heat, or cold. How long will the plants need to stay in the car or truck? If it's a very long time, your plants aren't going to like it. When I am going out to the plant store, I always make sure that that's my last stop if I'm running a lot of errands. And then I take my plants directly home from the plant store. And you start seeds from a pot. Oh yes, starting seeds in a pot is really quite rewarding. There are a couple differences than planting seeds directly into the ground. In the ground, you would make a row and then you would make a little trough where you're gonna be putting your seeds. In a pot, because it's so small, we don't make a trough. We merely scatter the seeds along the top of the plant. And I like to do it in concentric circles, but I've been told that I'm a little anal about this. So you put your seeds in, then instead of covering them with the existing dirt, you take fresh dirt out of your bag and you sprinkle the dirt lightly over the seeds. The amount of dirt will be specified on your seed container package and it can vary from a quarter of an inch up to in an inch. And then lastly, you're going to water. And you want to make sure that the water is flowing gently. You do not want to use a harsh stream of water that will dislodge your seeds. Selecting the right container. There are three basic materials that containers are made out of. You have non-porous, you have semi-porous, and you have porous. Non-porous containers can consist of plastic, metal, fiberglass, or glazed pot. These containers will lose the least amount of moisture. And when container gardening, it's all about moisture retention. 
So your non-porous plants are going to be probably your best choice for vegetables. Semi-porous plants could be comprised of wood or pressed fiber. Your pressed fiber pots are made to be temporary and they will disintegrate over time. And then lastly, porous pots. These are clay, unglazed ceramic, or terracotta. These are gonna lose the most moisture. And while they may look good, to avoid having to do a lot of water maintenance, you might consider using these types of pots for succulents or cacti. Now I wanna to talk to you about grow bags. Grow bags, when used, show more root growth. They prevent roots from circling out uh, the pots becoming root bound. They keeps the roots cool. The bags store easily and they are less expensive than other pots. Grow bags set up a condition called air pruning. This means that when the root tips hit the edge of the bag, they stop growing and they send a message back to the plant and the plant will send out another root. So here comes along another root. It hits the edge of the bag, it stops growing. Now the message goes back to the plant and a new root comes out, do 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 do. So we're setting up a condition that's encouraging roots. What happens when we have roots? They develop root hairs. The root hairs are the system which will transport the oxygen, water, and nutrients to the plant above. So we've got more roots, which equals more root hairs, which means more nutrients and water are gonna be going to the plant and the plant gets bigger. Now this is the trifecta that we all want for our plants, right? By using these grow bags, we're gonna actually be encouraging root growth. And that translates into bigger plants with more vegetables on them. Well, what size do I need? Well, the size of the container should match the plant's growth. Little plant, little pot, big plant, big pot. And we have to look at the size of the root ball. When we put big plants into small pots, it sets up a physical stress on the plant that causes a pronounced decrease in root growth and shoot growth. Second, flowering and fruiting is also reduced for plants in small pots. There are some shallow rooted vegetables such as lettuce, radish, and scallions that need a minimum potting mix depth of six to eight inches. Whereas carrots, they need a potting mix depth of 10 to 12 inches. For small pots, that would be eight inches in diameter or less. You need a pot that is one to two inches wider than your root ball. For large pots, 10 to 12 inches in diameter, you want a pot that is two to three inches wider than your plant's root ball. In your handout, you have this really cool chart, and this will tell you the minimum container size needed for a variety of vegetables. I'm gonna pause for questions now. If you have any questions, please enter them into the chat box. Thank you, Kay. Actually, we do have a couple of questions. When is the best time of the season to do your sun mapping? Oh, that's an excellent question. It depends on when you want to grow your vegetables. So if you want to do them in the summer, then you chart in the summer. If you want to start early in the spring, then you do one in the spring. And if you're going to be a fall grower, you do one in the fall. The sun pattern is going to change significantly depending on each season. So if you're a full season grower, you might be doing two or three charts so you know what's happening during each season. There's a question about tomatoes grown in a container that have become quite tall. They have them staked and they're wondering if they should cut them back. Well, you know, tomatoes do like to grow tall. And there are some tomatoes that are designed specifically for containers that stay short. But if you're in the middle of growing a big tomato, I would look and see how well the tomato is growing. If it's still bushy, I would let it grow and keep on staking it. But if you've got large lengths between the growth, if it's just getting really lanky, 
I would consider cutting it back. Allison, do you have something to add? I would just suggest maybe for containers going with bush tomatoes or determinate tomatoes that will stay at a smaller height. Indeterminate tomatoes are the ones that get quite tall and need staking or trellising. I've done that before I knew any better. And I've had containers that looked like they were porcupines with all the stakes I had in them. So for this year, I would just work through the problem and then next year, reconsider the type of tomato you're gonna plant in your containers. Okay, great. Does the sun mapping differ from region to region? Like would that matter between a tropical climate versus a temperate climate? Well, it doesn't matter how you do the sun mapping, but your results are going to change drastically, whether you're doing it in Florida or whether you're doing it in Minnesota. So how you go about doing the sun mapping is exactly the same. Your results are going to be quite different. If you're new to your garden or new to your home site, it really does help you see what the sun levels are like. We have one more question about growing cherry tomatoes in hanging baskets. Ooh, ooh, yes, there are several varieties of cherry tomatoes that are designed just for hanging baskets, and they do quite well if you get the right variety. Great, great, great. Okay, well, let's continue on, and we'll be back for questions shortly. Let's get down into the dirt right now, because it's not really dirt. When we're dealing with containers, we deal with soilless substrates or potting mixes. The most common ingredients are perlite, pine bark, sand, peat, and vermiculite. We no longer recommend the use of field soil. This would be soil you dig out of your yard or garden. This is because they often retain too much water, have too little pore space for oxygen, are too heavy, and potentially harbor harmful diseases, insects, and weeds. So these soilless substrates are filling in that need. Many potting mixes have been developed scientifically and they provide the maximum water and nutrient properties. We recommend reading the mixtures label to evaluate the components. If you purchase a commercial potting mix, make sure you read the label. It's really easy to start off with the commercial potting mix and then add ingredients as is needed. You'll find that some commercial potting mixes come with some fertilizer mixed in with them, and this will get your plants off to a good start. You can also make your own potting mix, and I'll give you a couple of formulas for them in a minute. Remember that no single potting mix is ideal for all containers. You often have to add components to get just the right potting mix. Here you can see some of uh, the potting mix ingredients. There's peat, perlite, and vermiculite. Two good combinations would be 50% peat and 50% perlite. Another would be 60% peat, 20% perlite, and 20% vermiculite. These formulas are also in your handout. How do you reuse potting mixes? Well, that depends. If your potting mix at the end of the season is still loose and crumbly and has a variety of small and large particles in it, yes, you can reuse it. But if it's a dark, compacted mess and you can see a bunch of roots, then no, you don't want to reuse that. Frequently what I will do is work through my potting mix and I'll pull out any clumps of roots that I see. Then when I've got those pulled out, I'll take my trowel and I'll stir up the soil that's in the bottom to loosen that up because that becomes very hard and compacted over time. And then I would consider adding new potting mix to that for my next go around. Can you reuse pots? Yes. We recommend that you wash your pots in a solution of non-bleach household disinfectant, such as Lysol. You want to make sure that you rinse your pots thoroughly before use. And if you're using clay pots and they develop a white substance on the outside, that's an accumulation of salt. You can scrub those with a wire brush to remove those salts. Potting plants. We suggest that your potting mix should be slightly damp before you add your plants. 
When you take your potting mix directly out of the bag, you will notice that it is extremely dry, very dry and very crumbly. If you were to put this in your pot without pre-wetting it and you go to put your water in it, the water will just gush right through. What you do is you add about a third of the dirt into your pot and then you mix it with water. And we suggest that you use warm water rather than cold. You add just a drop of dishwashing soap. This will act as a wetting agent and will help rehydrate the soil a lot better. Now, when it comes to the pot itself, you can see on the slide where the crown is, and then you can see the line that is called the substrate line. And you can see below that where the roots are. Well, the crown is actually the division between where the plant stems go and where the roots are sent down. You wanna make sure that the crown line is not being covered with dirt and you wanna make sure that the roots are not poking above the soil. When you put the plant in the pot, you also wanna make sure that there's sufficient space between the top of the potting mix and the top of the pot for allow proper watering. This space is known as the reservoir, and the reservoir space can vary from a quarter inch for small pots up to two to three inches for big pots. It all depends on the size of the pot. So when you start to fill the pot, you're gonna fill it in about a third of the way through with your growing media. Then you're gonna add your warm water with your soap in it, a drop of soap. Then you will put some water in it and then you'll take your trowel and you're gonna mix it up. You may wanna add a little bit more dirt and mix it up again. When you have it about a third to a half full, you're gonna take your plant with this root ball and you'll set it in there. You're gonna kind of eyeball it and you wanna make sure that the crown is going to be sitting just a little bit above where you want your reservoir line to be. Then you start adding more dirt around it and I water as I add more dirt. You fill the media around the roots and you line up the media with the substrate line. Both the plant and the media are now just a little bit above the desired reservoir depth. You shake the pot gently to spread the potting mix around the crown. When you water in, you'll see that the plant and the media will both settle down. There is no need to compact the growing media. Now, you never put a layer of gravel or broken ceramics into the bottom of the pot. This used to be the standard. When I was in grade school, my mother and my grandmother taught me that. You would always go out into the driveway and put some stones into the pot before you added any dirt. But that was also back when we were using garden soil and we were not using potting mixes. Today, potting mixes have developed to the point where we just don't need that extra stones for drainage. In fact, we have learned that doing so causes water to collect in the potting mix just above the gravel. It's only when there's no airspace left in the potting mix that the water will start to drain through. So by adding something extra, gravel or broken pottery, you're actually causing it to retain more water than if you have nothing in there. Some people are concerned that a lot of this potting mix is gonna rush out. It really doesn't happen. I have not used anything in the bottom of my pots for years now. And yeah, I might get a teaspoon or a tablespoon of dirt, but it's minimal. And again, I'm gonna talk about double potting. This also helps reduce moisture loss. Once again, I'm gonna pause for questions. And if you have any questions, please enter them into the chat. Great, thank you, Kay. Someone is asking, can you use cocoa core instead of peat moss as far as your soil mix? Allison, I'm going to throw that back to you. I, I think it would be fine. I'm not familiar with using it in that way, but I think that that would work fine. We had another question about reusing soil from year to year. Well, it is possible, but you want to assess it. What happens is that the roots start to cling together and then they compact. And if that's the case, you don't want to reuse that particular soil. So I would grab that root soil mixture 
and throw that out. Then you can add some new soil on top of that, but you want to mix the soil that's in the bottom of the pot with the new soil. I hope that explains it. But it's a question of, do you have both large and small particles? Is it loose? And then, yeah, you can reuse it. Mm -hmm. I think the thing with reusing soil also depends on disease or the plants you've been growing from year to year, wanting to make sure that you're not transmitting anything into your new crop. You want to be careful with that. There was another question about moving plants during the heat of the summer, if it gets too hot, about moving containers inside or under shade. If you've got air conditioning growing, I wouldn't move the plants inside. I think that might be a little shock to their little systems, but you can certainly move them in shade and they would enjoy that. Just keep in mind that vegetables want a full amount of sun. It's real hard to watch your plants when it's really hot out to see them wilt. So if you've got some nearby shade during the hottest part of the day, yeah, I would consider moving them. Okay, great. One more question about amendments to potting soil, if you could use compost. And I'm not sure about that, so I'm going to give that back to you. I think, again, it's fine. You know, you're just trying to get a good, well-drained mix and something that holds moisture. So if you feel like it's fairly clean and well composted and you're not able to see the, the food elements that you've put into your compost, that should work fine. So... Okay, I think we're good. Thank you, Kay. You're welcome. Watering. Oh, man. Watering is one of our most important considerations for plants. We find that plants in containers will dry out much more quickly than plants in the ground. So you need to check your containers frequently to see if they need watering. I will use my finger or my knuckle to test the dryness of the potting soil. Also, I might take a pinch of the potting soil and see if it sticks together or if it's really dry and crumbly. It is best to water in the morning. You want to avoid getting the leaves wet as much as possible. I use a watering rod to help me direct the water right down to the roots of the plant. I try to avoid watering in the evening or night. Wet leaves at night can encourage disease. Some veggies, such as tomatoes, need a lot of water. You might end up on a hot day watering them at least twice and maybe more, depending on your specific conditions. Veggies like about one inch of water per week as measured by a rain gauge. It is better to water deeply with a lot of water and then water less often. Watering deeply means that you have to moisten to the soil to a depth of six inches. This will encourage the growth of the roots. And when you have deep roots, this helps plants better to sustain stress caused by hot and dry weather. We recommend watering your plants from the top of the pot. Misting vegetables can result in the spread of diseases that rely on water to transfer spores from one plant to another. I'm asked a common question, should I water until the plant runs out the bottom? Well, depends on the size of the pot. If you're dealing with a small pot that would be eight inches or smaller, it's very hard not to have the water run out the pot bottom. But if you're dealing with big pots, it would take a lot of watering before that water runs out the bottom. And the more you water, the more nutrients are gonna be dissolved and work their way through the potting mix. I've also been asked about water retention crystals. These are products that retain a large amount of water and then release that water slowly over time into the pots. Research to the effectiveness of these products is inconclusive. Should you mulch? Yes, very easy and quick answer. Mulching will definitely help retain moisture. Fertilizers. This is always a question. There are three basic types of fertilizers we're going to talk about. There's controlled release, slow release, and liquid fertilizers. Controlled release are synthetic fertilizers that are designed to dissolve slowly over time. 
They tend to be more expensive, but they avoid high initial salt levels in the growing medium. The nutrients are available over several months and there is a reduction in nutrient losses by leaching and runoff. If applied as a top dressing, it also results in reduced nutrient losses because the nutrients have to travel through the media to reach the roots. And because the fertilizer dries out between waterings, the fertilizer will last over a longer period of time. Then there's slow release fertilizers, and these are available in both organic and synthetic forms. The organic fertilizers have low water solubility and prolonged nutrient release rates, sometimes over years. They are less concentrated per unit weight than synthetic fertilizers. The main disadvantage may be that their release rate is too slow for fast growing plants and you may need to supplement these with a liquid fertilizer. Liquid fertilizers are quick release and water soluble. The water solubles are best used after the plants are growing. They can quickly replace nutrients lost from the potting mix during a prolonged rainfall or periods of rapid plant growth. They are cheaper in cost per unit of nitrogen than slow release fertilizers. It's important to follow a regular fertilization schedule, and we'll talk more about this in just a minute. Another type of fertilizer are foliar or leaf fertilizers. This involves spraying nutrients directly onto the plant leaves and stems. These nutrients are very dilute to prevent burning of the leaves. Absorption is increased if you can get it on the underside of the leaf. Now, what this does, it sets up a situation where you're spraying like this. And what happens is then the fertilizer is gonna be falling down. So I strongly suggest that you wear protective gloves and long sleeves so you're not getting this fertilizer on yourself. These foliar fertilizers can be used as a supplement, but should not be used as a substitute for a potting mix fertility program. And the last of the fertilizers we're gonna talk about are granular fertilizers that are not time released. We usually don't recommend the use of these because these can burn the plant roots if they come in contact with them. Timing of fertilizers. There's a lot to this and I can't give you any specifics, but we can talk about some general rules. The amount of fertilizer you use depends on the types of plant growth, each plant's growth stage, the type of fertilizer you choose to use, and your watering habits. Some general principles you can consider are if you're using a potting mix that provides fertilization, you have to read the package to learn when the next round of fertilizer needs to occur. And they'll tell you on the package in three weeks, four weeks, 10 weeks, whatever, they'll tell you when you need to start fertilizing. If you're using this on transplant plants, usually after about three weeks after planting, you can add some more fertilizer. If you're dealing with seedlings, plants you've started from seed, you want to wait until three weeks after the plants have two sets of leaves. So you want to give these little seedlings a little time to mature before you start adding fertilizer. Nutrients levels do drop over time, and this is quite normal. They can drop because the plant is taking up the nutrients. They can drop because of excessive waterfall or overwatering. You can use liquid fertilizers once a week at half strength or every two weeks at full strength. With liquid fertilizers, you may have salt accumulation that can sometimes be a problem. And you can see this as a white crust on top of the potting mix. If this occurs, you can leach these from the soil by slowly running water through the medium for several minutes. Grooming. Well, when plants grow too fast and get leggy, you can solve this problem by pinching back the tops of the plants. By removing the top of the plant, it lowers the height and causes the plant to develop a bushier habit. Okay, let's talk about another aspect of maintaining our containers. First of all, sometimes when plants get tall and leggy, you will need to prune them or pinch them back. 
if the leaves start being well spaced out, I like to pinch them back so that they can form a bushier habit. Then there's deadheading. Now, with flowers, we definitely want to deadhead and remove the old flowers from the plant. If we're dealing with vegetables, we want to leave those flowers on the plant. Where that flower is, is where the fruit is going to form. General cleanup. Always remove dead tissue from your pot. These dead leaves are a perfect habitat for insects to breed and for diseases. And yes, you do get weeds in pots and it's best to pick them when the weeds are small. What do we do about pests and diseases? Well, the best thing is to frequently inspect our plants for diseases so we can treat them appropriately when they first start to develop. The best thing we can do is good watering habits and sanitation, and this will prevent the development of diseases in insect development. If you need more help on this, I suggest you see the pest management section of the North Carolina Extension Gardener's Handbook, and there is a link to this in your handout. I'm gonna pause again for questions. And if you have any questions, please enter them into chat. Thank you, Kay. We had a question about using rain barrel water for edible plants. And I put a couple of links in the chat box. Due to the nature of shingles and chemicals leaching from them, it's generally not recommended. Although I did find a study from Rutgers that they had implemented that showed comparing the water of their local municipality in New Jersey, that it was safe according to current levels of standards, but there was still some caution about that. So do a little research before you venture into that. Did get a question about slugs in the bottom of pots, wanting to know how to address slugs and sow bugs. Are they a problem? Well, slugs, if it's one or two, I would put my rubber gloves on and pick them up and throw them out. If it's a real problem, Allison, what's your best recommendation for slugs? <laughs> well, certainly they are nocturnal. And so if they are on the outside of the pot, going out and checking during the morning and hand removing them, trying to keep the pots a little on the dry side would be good. And then of course, the old beer solution that we've recommended does tend to work or putting out a piece of cantaloupe or watermelon and they'll go up into there and you can remove them that way. They can become a problem. I think our questions are done, Kay. Thank you. Okay. Now we're getting to my favorite part. We're going to talk about some specific vegetables and herbs that are kind of fun. I did not know this when I first started container gardening, but there are specific vegetables that have been designed for containers. And this was a complete revelation for me. Once I found this out, I was totally delighted. Here in your handout, we have this wonderful chart that gives you a bunch of varieties for vegetables. These varieties have been developed just for containers. Now that is so cool. I just love it. I've picked out several that I want to discuss with you just because they're neat vegetables. The first one we're gonna talk about is the mascot bush bean. This is a sturdy, upright form, but needs no staking. It grows to a height of about 18 inches. And here's the really cool thing. The beans are developing on top of the leaves. With a typical bean plant, you've got to hunt for your beans. They're hidden under the leaves. And with this one, as you can see, the beans are right out there in the open. I mean, that is really cool. The other plant I want to talk about is the patio baby eggplant. And look at this little thing. Can you see those little eggplants? Those are fully grown eggplants. They get to a size of about two to three inches. They're this luscious purple black color. And these babies lack the bitterness of the larger fruits. And I think they are just too adorable for words. The next one that I want to share with you are Bright Lights Chard. Now, if you're a chard fan, why not pick these? These are gorgeous. They come in ruby red, yellow, and white. And you've got all this wonderful color to add to your containers. And cucumbers. Now, most people do not think of growing cucumbers in containers, but 
with some trellising, they do really well. I don't use an expensive wood trellis like that. Instead, I will use the cheap tomato trellis that you buy for your tomatoes. Cucumbers grow up that, and it's just too cool to see these cucumbers hanging down where you can pick them so easily. So let's try growing cucumbers in a container. Astia zucchini. When I saw this plant, I just fell in love with it. It has these beautiful silver green leaves that are indented. I think the leaves alone are worth having on my deck. And in addition to that, it gets lots of fruit. We have to talk about tomatoes. This first one is called a tumbler tomato. It was designed specifically as a hanging plant. And you can see in this illustration, in addition to the tomato, they added some attractive flowers. So in addition to being very attractive hanging container, these tomatoes can produce up to six pounds of cherry tomatoes in a season. The other popular one is the patio tomato. Obviously, this was developed for the patio. The tomatoes are a little smaller. They grow to a size of about two to three ounces, but they are a heavy producer. In an eight-week season, they can produce as many as 50 tomatoes. Let's get into herbs. Herbs do really well in containers. I love to have some fresh growing herbs that I can add to my cooking. Now, herbs come in both annuals and perennials, and both do really well in containers. Your perennial herbs may need some maintenance and care. If you planted a rosemary bush and you've had it for two or three years, you may need to do some pruning on it and cutting back. Same with other long-growing perennial herbs. They may outgrow the first pot that you have put them in. Herbs can be used for cooking. There's nothing like having fresh basil, oregano, dill, chives, parsley, thyme, rosemary, and sage. And I view perennial herbs as an investment. Yes, you buy them, but they can last you two or three years. So I consider perennial herbs a very good investment. And then herbs can also be dried or frozen for use in winter. I'm going to talk to you about chives. This is an interesting plant. It has two uses. The first one, as we know, is culinary. You can cut it when it's small and tender and delicious and add it to your favorite recipes. But the second one is an added bonus. In the late summer and fall, they develop these beautiful flowers. I noticed that when I was touring Biltmore Gardens one year, they had used garlic chives as a border around their main planting areas. And there was nothing prettier than seeing these beautiful white flowers growing around their more expensive exotic plants. Now, the one thing about growing garlic chives is that after they flower, they will go to seed. And if you do not cut off these seed heads, these seeds will go everywhere and you will be having little tiny chives all over your garden. And lastly, here are two plants that can act as mosquito repellent, catnip and lemongrass. And at this stage, I will take more questions. Great. Thank you, Kay. Someone said that they've had good success growing cucumbers in a hanging basket. I would think that they would do really well there. And I would bet that depending on how high that basket is hung, they might grow right down to the ground. <laughs> I think that's a very creative thing. Mm -hmm. And maybe a good use of a bush cucumber, a compact form as well. Yes. Someone has put in a question about caring for herbs during the winter. How do I care for herbs during the winter? My plants always die. If they're in containers, you do need to take some precautions. And I'm so glad you asked this because I did forget to mention it. To get anything potted through the winter, you may need to consider wrapping it. But the most important thing, and we totally forget this, is that they need to be watered. They can't go all winter without watering. And I'm betting that more plants in containers die from lack of water than they do from freezing temperatures around here. So if you're going to wrap it, leave a place where you can add the water and remember to water. Winter, the air is drier. We get high winds, so they need some extra protection. 
and they need that water. Great. And certainly then someone is following up about wrapping plants. How do you recommend doing that? A common thing is to use burlap to wrap it. I've seen people use bubble wrap. And that seems to work well. Allison, do you have anything else to add? No, just moving it maybe to a more protective place under the overhang or closer to the house. Sometimes that can help. And of course, making sure your watering will be important. I'll say one other thing that I've done. With some of my perennial plants that are in pots, especially if it's a smaller pot, I will dig them up and I'll plant them in my raised bed for the winter. And that seems to give the roots a little bit extra protection. But I do have the luxury of having that raised bed there to do it. Mm -hmm. Somebody is asking about bringing them into the house. Well, it depends on what it is and how big it is. I think that you can successfully bring some rosemary in, maybe some chives in. What do you think, Allison? I think that would work. You want to make sure they stay cool and, you know, certainly not in a heated area. Maybe the chives could take a little bit of warmth, but something that's woody like a rosemary, keeping it on the cool side would help overwinter it because that's pretty much your goal is trying to overwinter it. I think that's it on our questions. If anybody has further questions, we have our garden helpline that is open and you can either call or email. We have master gardeners working remotely and slowly starting to come back into the office. We plan to open the office in early July. Feel free to call 250-4878 or email bunkummg at gmail.com with your follow-up questions. I want to thank you, Kay, for joining us this morning. It's been my pleasure. I've enjoyed this. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day in the garden. Thank you for joining us. Okay.